Hello and welcome back to Av Imperator Productions. I'm your host, Sulla, and today we are going to be taking a look at the ancient regimes of Western Europe in the Middle Ages. So, fundamentally, there was three different classes, or you could even say castes, of people in the Middle Ages through most of Western Europe. This was due primarily to the slow dissolution of the central powers and of any form of central government, and the need for independent and small areas to look after their own protection, their own sustainability, and their own way of life. We're going to take a quick look at these three divisions known in the West, especially in France, as the ancient regimes, and then we're going to dive a little bit into what warfare was, why cavalry became supreme, and the expanses of the types of strategic thinking at this period in time. So the three estates, what does it mean, what were they? The only real way to look at this is just to go straight through them, so I'm going to start at the bottom and work our way up to the first. So the third estate was mostly the peasants, it also usually included the bourgeois. The main difference between a peasant and a bourgeoisie was their location. Peasants were out in the country, mostly doing farming and mining the basic agricultural and industrial tasks of their civilization. The bourgeois were mostly in the cities. They were a little bit more held together and had a few more options with what exactly it was that they could do. So they did tend to accumulate a little bit more wealth and over time became much more influential, but there was no basic differentiation at the start of the Middle Ages between your average city peasant and country peasant. As I've mentioned before, when the Western Roman Empire began to fall, the East tried to put in some very crude stopgap measures, mostly to keep production of various necessities, iron, uh, grain, and different kinds of mining and agricultural inputs at the levels that would be necessary to continue for those different areas to survive. This was what became known as the feudal system, at least for the lower castes. So essentially the reason why peasants existed in the very first place was because you needed to take your father's job so that that job continued to exist. If everybody gave up blacksmithing, if everybody gave up woodworking and all of these a bit more intricate but still necessarily important positions, and just became farmers so that they could sustain themselves, the society would collapse even further and even more dramatically. In this way, the lower caste, the third estate of the ancient regime, was a necessity because of the declining population and because of the declining social and governmental structures. The second estate was the nobility, and Despite what it might sound like, the nobility actually had nothing to do with the king and the royal family. The nobility was everyone else that was of title. There was two main divisions of the nobility, the nobility of the robe and the nobility of the sword. This is pretty straightforward. The nobility of the robe were magistrates, they were diplo diplomats for the king, they were the ones out running the actual manners. The manor was the basic unit of functional society in the country. There would be a lord in his house. He would make sure that all of the peasants that were under his patronage had their various lands to work, the common grounds. There was a very sort of basic setup to the way that the manor worked, and the manor was essentially the individual unit of the feudal society. It is important to note that the nobility of the robe was mainly a 
function of the state, and at this time there was actually quite an acute separation of the church powers and the physical state powers, which was a marked development for the West, as in Western culture on a whole, which would become very important over time to the way that we live our lives today in modernity. The nobility of the sword, of course, had to be able to sustain horses, to buy armor, and to respond to calls from whoever was in a higher position of authority over them. Usually, lower nobles would respond to barons, barons would respond to dukes, dukes would respond to princes, and princes would respond up to kings. There wasn't always a king, and usually even when there was, especially in the early and high Middle Ages, the first two of three periods, the kings had very limited central authority and tended to actually have very few land holdings, making the Middle Ages tumultuous for a variety of reasons. If a collection of barons and dukes got together, they could easily have a military outweighing that of the king, which led often to some unfavorable situations for the overall political structure. Another very important aspect of this time was the rising importance of defensive warfare with the strategic building of castles and stockpiling of resources. A well-placed castle right at where a river could be crossed or between two sets of mountain ranges could very easily cut an entire kingdom in two and take a year or more to siege out, which meant that the king had to be very careful to keep these sorts of people in the proper favor. And in addition to the third estate, the peasants, the second estate, the nobility, which was not the king, and now we have the first estate, which was the clergy. The clergy were very important. Their structure of dioceses, of bishops, and of monasteries were actually the glue that sort of held Europe together at this incredibly tumultuous and quite dark and pessimistic time. There were, just like with the second estate, two divisions to the first estate. There were the noble clergy and the common clergy. The nobles would mostly be from noble families. If your first son was going to be the inheritor of your land, your second son would most likely try to become a bishop or something in that sort of effect. This had the twofold purpose of allowing a house to work together to control both the state and the religious aspects of their society, but it also weeded out large parts of the family that could not contribute and would not be able to easily take and divide what was given down through the rights of inheritance. There's actually a lot of really interesting concepts that we still hold on to quite dearly in our modern age that came from the clergy, the first estate, those being diplomatic immunity, the necessity for mass education, and the separation of church and state. Now, the main reason why the religious structure became so important in the West can be summed up in a very small anecdote. When Rome had been repeatedly sacked and Attila the Hun was coming in to burn it and raise it, there was no king, there was no emperor, there was no lord who led an army in the defense of the Roman people. All there was was one lonely bishop, the Archbishop of Rome, who would later be known as the Pope, Leo I. Leo came out by himself on a horse, went over to this ferocious group of rapacious individuals who had been attempting to get to the Roman hinterlands for a very long time, did a little bit of talking, and all of a sudden they were on their way out, going back to the Hungarian plains. This showed the role of the diplomat, of the speaker, of the learned scholar, and their influential position in the Middle Age society. So now, on to the rise of the supremacy of cavalry and the driving factors and psychological reasoning for battles in the Middle Ages. This was still during the time of the decisive battle. A decisive battle being one which the victor would come out obviously a victor and would be able to use his victory on the battlefield as a negotiating point for political intercourse. Just as the Byzantines had the Battle of Adrianople, 
which set across in their minds very quickly the importance of cavalry. The West actually had a few similar battles which showed the supremacy of the cavalry and of the horse archer over the heavy infantry. We're going to look at one in particular because we're going to be looking a lot at France in the next couple of episodes, and that is the Battle of Casilina. This was fought in about 553 AD. It was between Narses, who was given command of the Italian and the Western Roman uh, Reformation under Justinian after Belisarius had fallen out of favor. And it was between the Prototagma, which had been built by Belisarius, the soldiers, the heavy cavalry with bows, against the heavy infantry of the Franks. They essentially made a U and had their infantry in the center and continuously allowed the Franks to advance and advance and then completely encircled them, raining down arrows, retreating their own infantry, and causing a mass slaughter. From this point forward, from 553 to about the 9th century AD, the Franks and a lot of the other Western European powers would continue to put more and more effort into building up their cavalry forces, although the supremacy of the cavalry force would not come until the invasion of the Magyars, the Northmen, the groups we call the Vikings, and those sorts. Mainly because it's not very well portrayed in this day and age, but when the Northmen came for a raid, the first thing that they actually did was secure horses for themselves, because they couldn't often bring them along on their long ships. They would go in, they would find these horses, and then they would immediately begin raiding, pillaging, and slaving. This meant that by the time the local nobility and the central uh, government structures had raised levies and had sent them towards where the Northmen had landed, they would usually be gone, and all that there would be left was the smoking ruins of whatever settlement or monastery or other civilian sphere they had destroyed. This caused a lot of frustration, and the footmen of the infantry of the Franks would always be one step behind the impounded cavalry that the Northmen would be able to wield. Due to this, the Supreme and the Battle of Castlenum, which was the pitched battle of two states, and the internal raiding battles with smaller war bands, the necessity for cavalry became abundantly apparent, and the beginning of the knight and the middle Age warrior that we're all so familiar with today began to take shape. Now, I mentioned the idea of the decisive battle. This is actually a fairly standard convention in the West, but it wasn't always, and it actually had to be agreed upon. The Byzantines didn't much like battle, they saw it as a complete rule of luck or chance, and they knew that just because they had won a major battle, that didn't mean that their enemy was defeated, that didn't mean that their enemy would even acknowledge that the battle had been lost, and it certainly didn't mean that the war could be ended or that any sort of political negotiations could be started. But in the West, they had a slightly different conception. They were mostly fighting against other kingdoms and against other societies which had similar beliefs. And so they began to coalesce certain conventions which allowed for the different groups of the different militaries to have similar rules which came to be standard battle conventions. In the West, battle was not seen so much as pure luck or chance as it was the divine will of God, with both sides claiming that God was on their side and both sides claiming that they had the same God. It became a little bit more dicey as to what a battlefield win meant, and there was also a interesting concept in the West called the divine right of kings. A king got to rule because God had ordained him so. But if a king had been ordained by God, and another king had been ordained by God, and they fight, and one wins, what does that mean? To the average person, to the average military soldier, this meant that the one divine right had outweighed the other. So in a sense, when the king was answerable to no one, he was still answerable to the battlefield. And in this way, the Western powers would duke it out, eventually 
they, they actually really didn't engage in battle all that often because if you were a king and you were a little bit shaky on whether or not you were going to win it all and you knew that a loss could not be recouped because the other side and even your own side would see it as a message that you were illegitimate from God himself, it became a much more interesting and a much more decisive means of settling disputes. When both sides agreed that the battle had been won by one side, and that meant that God was on their side, it meant that a battle was decisive, and winning a battle could be used to further political ends, regardless of the actual stance of the war. Through these methods, victory had become defined, the path to victory had become defined, and standard conventions and ways of waging war and producing battles became more of a contract and less of a function of some sort of code or chivalry. Now I said battles weren't all that common, so if they weren't and there was a lot of warfare going on, then what were they doing? They were relying a lot more on the primitive side of strategy and on the more basic elements. It actually looked a lot like when we looked at the primitive societies and the ways that they would engage in proto-war. So we're mostly talking about sieges, massacres, hostages, and political demands. Between these four items, you could usually settle a dispute without ever having to go to the battlefield and question whether or not God was actually willing to allow you to dominate your neighbor. This too would become a staple of Western society, not only the convention of the decisive battle, but also the concept of standard sets of rules for war, of limited engagements, and of the necessity for other means to achieve a political goal through the use of military other than simply offering battle. Alright, well, thank you very much for watching. I hope that you enjoyed. If you did, uh, feel free to leave a like, or if you want to see more uh, content like this, feel free to subscribe. This one's going to be a little bit shorter. I'm actually thinking about shifting the focus of this channel. Um, we're going to go a little bit further with this series, and then I think I'm going to start to do something a little bit different, but because I'm going to have this one be a little bit shorter, I'm going to have a lot more with the early modern and the renaissance sort of styles, so thank you very much for watching. Hope to see you again next time, but until next time, remember, have a broader.